In just a few moments, I'm going to reveal how you can get a free Stay Strong and Protect the Weak bumper sticker delivered right to your home. On today's show, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, Dr. Harriet Fraud, comedian Ethan Hershenfeld, he's the author of Today Is Now, and Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny introduces us to maybe a girl who is running for California's 30th Congressional District. Maybe is the first drag queen in American history ever to hold elective office. She is currently serving as treasurer and at-large representative for the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council in Los Angeles. She is strong on all the issues Howie and I care most about. She wants to eliminate ICE. She wants to ban private and for-profit prisons. Right there, on those two issues, she deserves your support just for those two positions alone, eliminating ICE and banning private for-profit prisons. She's also strong on Medicare for All, the Green New Deal, free tuition of public universities. Let's send her to Congress. She's thoroughly vetted by Howie Klein, who will be joining me tonight for a special Meet the Candidate edition of Office Hours. Doors open at 7.30 p.m. It's hosted by Zoom, but you can dial in by phone as well. You don't need Zoom. The link to register is in the show description. Or go to my website and hit Office Hours. It will take you right there. You click on the Office Hours menu, it will take you to the landing page for tonight's event. Tonight, March 24th, for Maybe a Girl, on Zoom, the doors open at 7.30 p.m. Come meet Maybe a Girl and Howie Klein. If you don't have Zoom, click on it anyway. We are making it possible for you to dial in to the event. Several phone numbers will be provided. And anybody who donates to Maybe gets a free Stay Strong and Protect the Weak bumper sticker. You don't have to donate to attend because there are other ways to help maybe besides money. There's donating your time and, of course, word of mouth. And you can donate immediately by going to maybeagirlforcongress.org. Maybe is spelled M-A-E-B-E, a -A -A, a girlforcongress.org. She's strong on all the issues you care about. It's going to be a fun and important evening of politics, activism, and an opportunity for you to be heard. I look forward to meeting you. I need this. This is for me, Harry <laughs> Fraud. These are the topics we're going to cover. We're going to try to cover mass violence, the banking scandal, Macron surviving the no confidence vote, and human nature when it comes to meetings and parties and the question, can you have democracy without leadership? Let's start with Macron, because that's really that's the first depressing story, because we love the French, don't we? He, he took advantage of a clause like a dictatorial clause in their constitution where he said, I can yeah. just act unilaterally raise the pension retirement age to 64, and then you do a no-confidence vote to see whether or not you want me to be punished for this. What I'm saying is Marine Le Pen, who we don't like, far-right French leader, she's taking to the streets to protect the pension. You know, we would in America call her a faux populist because she sides with Donald Trump and Viktor Orban but there she is out of, you know, I'll take their faux populists over ours anytime. She's out there protesting to keep the pension at 62. In order for a fascist to be popular, they have to have some populist material. The reason that the Nazis, Nazi is short for national socialists, okay? They called themselves socialists so that they would look populist. Mm -hmm. you, you have to look like you are on people's side. 
even though you're not. And I remember seeing an interview, I think it was done by Arlie Hushelt, I'm not sure, but where they, she was asking this guy, why do you support Trump? He said, look, I know he's not going to deliver on what he says. He's not going to bring manufacturing jobs back, but he captures our anger. Right. And the anger, and the you anger is good look, enough. The, just the anger. No, it's not. Well, I'm saying for the Republicans, it's good enough for somebody like Chip Roy or uh, Murkowski up in Alaska to just say, I'm angry. And people go, oh, fa- I'm, I like this person. I'm angry, too. They're not going to deliver anything, but they're angry. Has that always been but the, the other people, the, Biden doesn't even act angry right. at the injustices to ordinary people. So at least that's an advantage. Look, I, I think Nazis have to look like they support ordinary people or else, you know, why should, you know, they can't only say I'm for the corporate elite. They'll right. never get any votes. And they've always done that. That's how they get the votes. They, That's how Hitler got in. And, and the Nazi party, like the Republican Party, and I know people say you lose the argument when you compare Republicans to Nazis. But both parties have, well, the Republicans have become a repository of unresolved trauma. You look at... Yeah. You look at all these Republicans, they're either in the closet or there's some kind of childhood trauma that they're papering over through their politics. These are bad toilet training, but these are right. Well, well, they're also people who are criminals by and large. You know, they're supposed to be for protecting minors from sex, right? Right. But there you have Warren Boebert's son, who's 17, got his 15-year-old girlfriend pregnant, and she's having a baby. Can you imagine what kind of good parents these would be? And the husband was arrested for indecent exposure uh, like 20 years ago. Yeah, just like Sarah Palin's, uh, you know, son got somebody pregnant. And these people, and they're thieves, too. Matt Getz is a sex abuser who brought somebody across state lines, a minor to have sex. These are criminals, and so were the Nazis. Right. They're criminals, but they know how to capture mass discontent. Right. And there is no party that represents working class people in their interest and confronts capitalism. We don't have a choice of system. We have a right. choice of two people who are different, but not different enough, and no choice of system, which they do have in France, Germany, and all the Scandinavian countries. You know, you have a socialist party, a communist party, capitalist parties, right. Christian parties, fascist parties. And, and even Great Britain, for a time, offered, at least for after, time, after the war, uh, they offered temporarily uh, some social safety net. Uh, I'm disappointed with the French, but these pro- it's law now. Yeah, the retirement age has been raised to 64. But they can change it. You know, laws can be changed when there's pressure enough. Yeah. And I don't know how they'll handle it, but maybe with a general strike or two, it'll be handled. Because laws can be changed. You make laws, you can change laws. Me- Me- is it Melanchon? That's how you change the laws. Who's, Mel- who's Melanchon in, in, in France? Melanchon is a man who got an enormous number of votes by creating a unified left party with climate activists, feminists, people of color, all sorts of sexual rights people and indigenous people of various kinds together. He unified the left. And even though this only happened a couple of months before the election, he got a sizable proportion of the seats. Right. Not majority, because Macron had won before, and he had won by a landslide, as a kind of compromise candidate that nobody had ever heard of, but who seemed like a compromise candidate and would never get reelected. But Mélenchon is the unifier of the left. And the Communist Party even joined it, too, which they almost never joined socialists. And did he deliver? I mean, it was a squeaker, the no confidence yes, vote. he did. He delivered. Within his first few months, they raised the minimum wage by 15 percent for civil service workers, by 10 percent for everyone else. And he has gone on from there. All his legislation is progressive and he's very popular. OK. Before and we he has appeared at these demonstrations. Before we leave France and land in Silicon Valley, Hollande was a socialist president of France, but he got elected at an unfortunate time. It was 
after the financial crisis when the EU decided, oh, we need a fiscal austerity. It's, they went totally anti-Keynesian in Europe to prolong the financial crisis. Hollande, was he, was he sabotaged? Hollande was a sellout. He was, he was like the Labor Party candidate under Bush. You know, he was a total sellout and corrupt guy. And he ditched uh, the woman that he'd been living with forever, had six kids with, and took up with a right-wing woman and brought her into the palace and then was leaving at night alone on a motorcycle to hook up with somebody else. And he didn't come through at all for anyone. You know, he was a total washout. And he kind of, he gave them a black eye, the Socialist Party, a black eye, the way the guy did during Bush. Now I forget his name because I... Uh, he's such a disappointment. You're they called him Bush's Poodle. Bush's Poodle. Oh, Tony Blair. Tony Blair. Oh, yes, from the Labour, Labour yeah. Party in yeah. name only. Right. The third way. So yeah. Hollande was in name only a socialist. You bring up Tony Blair. We're celebrating, you know, if you own stock in Halliburton, we're celebrating the <laughs> 20th year of the invasion of Iraq. No lessons learned. Not a single lesson learned. No lessons learned. They marched on to Afghanistan to lose. Yeah, no, no lessons. And then, uh, no lessons. And then, well, it's what they learned is you may not be able to win, but you can destroy a country, A. And B, you can sell a lot of armaments. And the United States is first in the world in that only. Okay. Sell military. Before we get to Silicon Valley, and this probably has something to do with Silicon Valley, normal people, not, not normal people, most people, because there's no such thing as normal, but most people can't imagine the, the depths of evil people among us are capable of. There are bad people out there, aren't there? And there are people who, in bad circumstances, turn you know, and who can't see hope, who can't see humanity. Look at Trump lying, rapist, and Bannon. You know, these are opportunist capitalists who went along and got away with it and did more and more and more and don't really care. They're total narcissists and don't care about anybody else. And capitalism brings that out in people because you make more money by paying people less or hiring uh, migrant children or whatever else they're doing these days. Right. Bad people. You make more for you. Bad people. No, you're not a bad person, but you're a person in a bad system who is influenced to take advantage of the rewards that are there and of thinking that being rich is the end all. More, more for you. Right. And so their, their humanity atrophies. Their humanity, they become dehumanized and dehumanized. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And they are willing to exploit children. Look at all those people hiring migrant children who are right. lost in the system because the system doesn't care. Well, right. well, they're making money. Right. And when they go, you know, Trump used to say, I'm rich, I'm rich. And he got a lot of popularity. Right. People hire the rich. That's why Santos said he was so rich. Right. They both lied. And Santos he, and Trump lied and, about being yeah, rich. I have Absolutely. Right. That's right. Bad. They all lie. And the values are perverted. You know, we talked about the monarchy here. I don't know if you've kept up with the latest, but since Meghan and Prince Harry spilled some of the beans, the royal beans, <laughs> they had um, a property. You know, they have $28 billion, that monarchy. So they have a lot of houses around and they had something called Frogmore Cottage, a beautiful little house with manicured gardens who are manicured by the many gardeners they hire. And because they spilled the beans, Prince Charles took their house away and instead gave it to Prince Andrew, the celebrated pervert. Right. Those are the priorities. Right. Because keeping secrets is much more important right. than not raping children. Right. Whoa. Well, you know, those are the values. And they get away with it. You, you are a psychotherapist and you help people deal with the neuroses and paranoia and complications that uh, spring out of the economic system we're forced to live under. Identifying, uh, you, you don't believe there's such thing as bad people. You think it's a, well, there's no sweeping generals. I don't want to make a sweeping no, general. I don't think there are bad people. But you, you don't believe there are bad people. I think people tend to really behave badly. Like is George W. Bush, a is George W. Bush evil? Is he a bad person? Or he was a bad I think he's I'm sorry? stupid. Yeah. 
I think he's a really stupid. I remember this black woman saying to me, you white people, here you go. George, he got rice pudding between the ears, but he's got a billion dollars, and now he's the president. Right, right. right. But you know, first of all, he's rich. But second of all, he grew up in that billionaire corrupt family, and what he thinks is important is winning. So even though he got out of the army and never fought, bring him on, he says, right. killing people. Right. But that's the world he lives in. That's his social world. So you're able to- I wouldn't want you're able to forgive him. Well, I would like to see him jailed for life. Right. But I would I don't but I don't think he's inherently evil. I just think he was brought up in a disgusting billionaire environment with war criminals like his dad and his family that helped the Nazis, the Bushes right. during World War Two. Brown hair. That's the environment. Yeah. And his mother when she saw all those people in the big gymnasiums because they've been flooded out in New Orleans made an arch comment about these are probably the best accommodations they'd ever have, you know. Right. These are, he was trained out of compassion, unfortunate slight, but he's not inherently evil. Right. It's not the devil, it's the environment. Uh, let's talk about Silicon Valley Bank and the bank run. What, what happened? Has it been handled properly? Well, I think what happened is, you know, the banks take your money in, they promise you safety, and they give you nothing in return but safety. Right. And then they take your money and invest it. And after 2008, Dodd-Frank passed a law that you had to have a certain amount of reserve so that if your loans are not really bringing in the money, mm -hmm. then you can still pay back your depositors. But corrupt legislators went along with pressure from Silicon Valley Bank, like Kristen Sinema, who accepted 50000 from Silicon Valley Bank for her campaign. And they helped her write the legislation that said that they were too small, that you didn't need to worry, that the banks were so stable that they could ignore Dodd-Frank. And America is so corrupt now. It took 30 years after the Glass-Steagall Act, did the same thing after the Depression. It took 30 years to undo it. It only took eight years after Dodd-Frank to bribe the legislators. And I looked it up. There are so many times more lobbyists than there are even lawmakers. Right. And they write, the lobbyists wrote the law. And so 90% of their deposits were not guaranteed, and they weren't under the 250000 dollars and that the FDIC will, will guarantee. And Biden decided we'll pay back all depositors. Why should my tax money go to somebody who can just put a half a million discretionary dollars in the bank? I don't believe in that. Also, the message for that is, OK, bank, be completely irresponsible in your loans because Silicon Valley Bank was the, the bank for venture capitalists and tech startups, right? which often fail. So right. they needed to keep a bigger reserve. They didn't. And it says, go ahead, banks, make risky investments, whatever you, you please, because taxpayer dollars will repay you. And not the dollars at the top, because they, you know, like Trump bragged, he didn't pay taxes. Romney, responsible citizen, said he's paid 13 percent. Warren Buffett said his secretary paid more than he did. Right. Because they have really good tax lawyers right. to manipulate the loopholes and so on. And, and so our scarce money is going towards irresponsible lenders and tech startups that have a half a million dollars. So I think that's disgraceful. And I think their response to it, he said, don't worry, we will reimburse the depositors. Well, all depositors, even ones with a half a million dollars to throw away. And it, it basically says, forget Dodd-Frank, forget regulations, do what you want, and the government will bail you out. Right. Which is quite the message. Right. So it does get me angry. Yeah. Yeah. And that they bribe the lawmakers to get away with it. It's well, such corruption. Uh, very quickly, because I want to ask you uh, about democracy and leadership. Uh, the antithesis of such is the man who may be arrested tomorrow here in New York City. We, we hate Donald Trump in New York City. There, nobody's going to be taking to the streets other than to celebrate. No. If not he, from New York, we're not. Yeah. No way. Do you think he'll go? Except to cheer me. Yeah. Do you think he'll go quietly? I hope he goes to jail. I hope he goes to jail. He certainly belongs there. And it will be a travesty if he doesn't. He has five big cases coming up, all of which are damning him. And 
He's got, he'll be going to jail. He should go to jail for all five. But also the Stormy Daniels case is not just because he had an affair. He paid that 130 grand because it was before the election. He'd already gotten a blackened eye when it was revealed how he said that he can and loves to grab pussy and get away with it, right? right. Sexually predatory and enjoying it. So he couldn't really afford another scandal right on top of that. So that they were in a big hurry to pay Stormy Daniels off. They had the catch and kill the story deal with David, cutely enough, David Pecker. Yeah. Uh, Great well name. Named, Great name. At the, yes, yes. At the uh, Inquirer. Right. But he just paid 150 grand for uh, Karen McDougal so he, about that affair. So he didn't want to have to shell out another 130 for this story and then quash it. So uh, this was this is election fraud because you have to declare your election expenses so that the public has some way of knowing what you're doing to win. And he hushed it up. He had Michael Cohen pay and then he wrote it off as legal expenses and paid Cohen back slowly over a lot of time and paid him over 400,000, I think 465,000, but it was over 400 for his $130,000 expenditure. That's bribery. It's also fooling the American public about his election expenses. And that's what Santos is getting in trouble with too. Right. For too. It's one of the things. And it's the, it's the, to me, it's the least of Donald Trump's crimes. This, this. Well, it's another way of interfering with the election. Right. And so and I am an admirer of Stormy Daniels. She's the first one to expose him and not be afraid, even though she was threatened and they threatened to kill her kid and so on. Nobody she is better. Her husband. Yeah. Nobody's better at exposing someone else than somebody willing to expose themselves. Herself. So finally, This is great. Thank you. You are a founding mother of women's liberation. You've sat through more meetings than I'm sure you'd uh, like to. Yeah, there was. Talk to me about meetings, parties, political parties, groups, how you have to be careful. I want to frame it. Uh, can there be democracy without leadership? No, I think, look, first of all, you have to admit whatever movement you have, you often have FBI or CIA agents there trying to disrupt it through creating political identity disputes or whatever, and changing the topic from the political agenda at hand, starting in internecine disputes that bore everybody and make them turn off. Right. So you need to have someone who is responsible to the group who is a leader. But somebody has to have the courage to say, that is completely off topic and divisive. Next, someone has to take charge to protect the group. Right, right. Because you have to put the group first before individual people who want to act out. And wherever you have a group, first of all, you often have spies, but then you also have disturbed individuals who just want to create conflict and get attention. <laughs> so somebody has to have a strong hand. It's uh, true. People are, there are disturbed people who want attention and delight in creating, I'm sorry, conflict. conflict. And look, there are conflict addicts. In California, they originally had, they had an AA, you know, they had an an anonymous group, Conflict Addicts Anonymous, CAA. But they had so much conflict that they couldn't find the meetings. <laughs> so it uh, worked out. But it started in the 1970s because there are people who find excitement in creating conflict and they try as hard as they can. And to protect the group, somebody has to protect the group. And leaders emerge, whether they're acknowledged or not, they emerge in every leaderless movement because some people feel responsible and take charge and and other people don't. And I think so many people now are experiencing stark meetings on Zoom. You get to see behavior stripped raw without any of the pheromones. And, you know, when you're in a room with people, there's something else going on. But when you're in Zoom, you, it's you're not responsible or accountable. That's I'm sorry. Right. Often you become unaccountable when you're not personally in front of people. And you're you not s- accountable for what and do. 
But it's a master's class in human behavior because people are, they, they speed up their bad, the bad behavior happens much quicker in a Zoom meeting. So learning to lead a meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, that has surprised me is uh, I, I, there's a, a YouTube channel that I have and I printed out in order to comment I have community guidelines. Do not share any anti-vax, uh, any alternative cures for COVID. They, these comments will be deleted. Do not attack unions. Do not say anything bad about Bernie Sanders. We're not here to hear anything. And I have a list of topics that are verboten. And some, pe some people have commented, well, this is fascism. And I wrote, no, it's not. I, I don't. There's no law that says I have to hear your opinion. And or I that you have to be on this uh, channel either. Right. I don't want to. Choice. Right. I don't want to hear anti-vax, anti-union right. conversation. Not here. And right. Yeah. We're in the other places. Uh, and so I, I find I'm cultivating uh, a pretty, the YouTube channel unbeknownst to me, the people follow the rules. I have to throw a couple of comments out, but for the most part, people go, oh, I better not, you know, spread anti-vax right. material. Uh, but that is- that, Those are the terms that you set. <coughs> I'm sorry, what? You set the terms and people function within them or they're shut up. That makes a good, you know, that makes good sense. And the, the mistake that I make in other situations is being overly inclusive, perhaps, and by allowing certain... Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry, you're... you're you, I, you have to watch out that you don't sacrifice the group for the uh, disruptive individual. Right. Because you have to look out for the group and for the purpose of the group, rather than let some individual do their thing that wrecks the group. Right. Is factionalism inevitable in every group? And, and is that where the leadership comes in? is finding the glue that holds the group together? Well, the glue that holds the group together is, it would be in your audience, a set of principles and beliefs in kindness, social, political, and economic respect, and giving a perspective that they won't hear in the New York Post or in the kind of Trumpian external media. Right. And that's, therefore, you say no anti-vax and so on. Right. And people who are on that have to obey the rules for that. And if they don't, they have to be asked to leave. Right. You know, you just, otherwise, you sacrifice the whole group for the disruptive individual. Right. The top, and individual yeah. rights have to be within a context of a group. Right, right. You are in a group. Right. What, it can take one or two people who can, oh, yeah. to destroy... If if your weak need one person can just sow a lot of problems politically, that's right. But you know, if you're a politician, you don't want to lose votes. You're tempted to keep. I, I could see the temptation of a politician not wanting to throw somebody out because you don't want to make an enemy. You don't want to lose a vote. But the Republicans have proven. A smaller we'll do it right away. I'm sorry. They drag people. The Republicans drag people out right away. A smaller tent. Anyone said that negative? Out. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can accomplish more with a smaller tent. You don't have to be a big tent party. You just have to. No, you don't. Right. And you also can maintain rules, and someone has to have the strength to do that, because most people won't. Right. I remember, you know, after the Panthers were basically invaded by FBI agent thugs in New Haven, right. um, we had a, a joint demonstration of the women's liberation movement for Erica Huggins and the Panthers for Bobby seal or bobby or um, the huggins guy i forget his name and they were just ignoring us and nobody would say anything so they sent the heavy in that was me and i uh you know said look we're not going to do this demonstration with you we'll make a public thing of leaving the demonstration and so you won't have our people with you right. and then we repaired to our women's liberation movement meeting at someone's house and the guy came to the door one of these panther FBI thugs, and he said, you know, listen to me, I used to stop pussy. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, that's what he said. And I said, we're so worried about getting our pussies stomped. Get the fuck out of here or we'll call the cops. Yeah. And he left, went down to the street with his loudspeaker calling us names, okay? But nobody else said anything. 
Right. You need to have someone who is a leader who isn't afraid. And, you know, in your in your shows and your chats and stuff, your social hours, you are the leader and you are recognized as such. And you don't want disturbed individuals to disrupt the cohesion and kindness that you establish. Right. And it's not anti-democratic to remove disruptors. Absolutely not. What's democratic is protecting the public. Right. Protecting the group from the disturbed individual. Now... Because you have to sacrifice something. Either you sacrifice the purpose and the goal and the connection of your group, or you sacrifice the boisterous individual who is disruptive and crazy. Right. So I, you know, there, there's the, the threat of COINTELPRO and the CIA and the FBI going in and disrupting. There's also... Right. More likely, people who show up to meetings just because they want to ruin them, either because, as you say, they're conflict addicts or or they are members of the other team and they figure I can this would be a lot of fun to pretend to be on the left and destroy. And, I, and I'm actually helping my movement. I mean, I've thought about doing that. You know, I thought about joining a Republican group and destroying it. So you, you, you have to have antennae that, that can hear uh, and they're manuals. I'm sorry. Yeah. And you often these individuals keep talking. And so you have to say you had a turn. Others need to talk now. Right. And you have to take it over. Right. Because otherwise, you know, some people are just crazy and wanting attention. Right, right. So, you know, they're just disruptive. Other people are political disruptors. Right. But you, you have to, your job as a leader is to protect the group, not to protect the disturbed individual at the expense of the group. Right. Because you're trying to keep the group together. The group discovery of one another, the group cohesion, the group cooperation. Right. And... So it takes someone who is willing to say this isn't appropriate. Right. I think I told you when I was in women's liberation, we had one rule that I thought of and everybody liked it. Everyone is welcome at our meetings unless they know exactly what we have to do. Then they have to get out immediately. <laughs> and so when people, <laughs> wow. Wow. when people started, saying, what you have to do is I'd say, please leave. Right, right. We don't welcome that. We right. find our decision making together. We talk together. We issue, discuss issues together. You know what we want? Get out of here. Right. You, uh, people appreciate I'm sorry? People appreciated it because they wouldn't have had the courage to do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love you. Thank you. This is, uh, this was, this one was for me, folks. <laughs> I did well, this, 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 this episode. They're is, for me. <laughs> this is for me. Dr. Harriet Fraud is the host of Capitalism Hits Home, Interpersonal Connections on WBAI. I probably got interpersonal update. BAI, if they ever let it let me be on. I'm supposed to be on Tuesday nights at 6.30, although right. they're often usurped with other things. And I'm a co-host with Liam Tate and Ikoi Hero of It's Not Just In Your Head, another podcast. And how do people contact you? Either through my website, harrietfraud.com or hfraad at gmail.com. Fantastic. I'll see you next week. Thank you. See you next I week. I hope so. Okay. We love you here. Yes. Thank you. We love you too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was just tremendous. Tremendous. Yeah, okay. Joining us now, it's the Hershenfelds. Dr. Philip Hershenfeld is a real Freudian psychoanalyst, a real deal. And Freud is making a comeback. I don't know if you read the article. I did. I did. Yes. So we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk with Ethan Hershenfeld, whose book, Today is Now, by Dr. Samuel Benjamin, who is his alter ego. Go by Today is Now, and if this doesn't make you happy, I will reimburse you. That is the Feldman guarantee, and maybe at the end we can do a, a brief reading. We can wrap up today with a brief yeah, the reading. The book itself is brief. If I read the whole thing, it would be a brief reading. <laughs> so that's the good thing about writing a brief book. By the way, F Freud is making a comeback like the Knicks. <laughs> it's uh you know it's not he, you know he's popular sometimes he's he's not popular other times but he's never a lad pop. he's popular like you know like uh like tofu like <laughs> some, a few people that you can't really get a whole movement going you're not gonna be able to change the 
the palates of the of of the populace. But a few people will enjoy it. A few people will get some health out of it. A few people will get some jokes out of it, just like with tofu. But in the end, it just cycles through between not popular at all to a little bit popular. That's my take. Well, I don't like to talk about the doc, the real doctor's personal life. Yes, but I am I overstepping when I say that Freud had a profound effect on you? Is that a violation of your privacy to say that you became a a Freudian psychoanalyst because so much is there? Well, so much is there. So he discovered so much, but he died in 1939. And what's that, 80 years ago? And um, a lot, a lot, a lot has developed but on the foundation that he started. We don't do things the same way as we do them then, as we did them then. I, I, I'm going to tell, tell a little vignette, which I may have said before on this show. So, Ethan, would you please interrupt me if I have? Well, you've been doing this for three years, so and we have new yeah. listeners. So. so I've had two identical pu letters published, one in the New York Times and one in the London Review of Books. And and they were letters about two totally different books, One the book reviews. So one of the books um, in Great Britain proved that Freud was dead. And then there was an American book that proved that Freud was dead. And I wrote essentially the same letter to both. And they published. Both of them published it to their credit. What I said was, I to am... To your so credit, you, to your credit, you cited yourself. <laughs> Sharper than a serpent's tooth. <laughs> so, so what I said was, I am so happy that Professor So-and-so has yet again written a book proving that Freud is dead. If you will notice, nobody writes books proving that Mesmer is dead because he is actually dead. <laughs> so, Great. So, so as long as people keep writing these books, which they do many times a year, as a Freudian analyst, I am more than delighted. So then on the flip side, now that they're writing an article saying that Freud is alive, you must be worried. <laughs> Good point, doctor. Well, I, I love what you just said, that in 19, he dies in 1939, medicine is a progression. So, of mm. course, the, the things that you learned by 1939 yeah. may not be applicable Today, by the way, he he was from Vienna, uh, Freud, and it's it's an interesting um, fact that in Vienna and in some of those other countries, like in Austria and in Germany, their nines, 1939 ends in the number nine. They write their nines like we write our G's. Mm. Their nines, they don't stop. They don't end with a vertical going down. They then curl back up. Anyway, go on. <laughs> <laughs> And from this, we learn what? Nothing. No, no. uh, so. But you see, this is a perfect, perfect example of Freudian technique. We're just all free associating and we'll see right. where it ends up. Right. Okay. And why do you, why do the G's, what, what is it about G's that, that you find interesting? And do you prefer nines or G's? Nine. Nine? You're not going to answer? What do you well, prefer? Really if you looked at the word Grossinger's, when I was a kid, this was intriguing. <laughs> because it begins, it begins with a capital G, but the capital G in script is the most ornate Baroque letter in the whole script alphabet. If you write a script G the way they teach you, you go up, it's got a curl, then you go across, it's got another curl, then you come down, <laughs> then it's got a swoop and a belly, then it goes back this way, <laughs> goes back. It's an insane letter. I used to stare at those packages of Grossinger's rye bread. It was, you could burn enough calories <laughs> looking at that letter, trying to figure it out. What is it today about Freud? Is it because once Prozac was invented or discovered, People said, ah, problems can be treated chemically. There's no need to talk it out. And now people are discovering what I suspect you knew all along is that you can't do it just with pills by themselves. Is, is that why people are rediscovering Freud? That's I one of the so. reasons. <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, generalize. You have to ask <laughs> the other hand. <laughs> Well, we are, what we you have, David. What I've been trying to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why are we having dinner? We can eat outdoors pretty soon. Yes, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, can, I, yeah. let's, but, um, there's a good news. Ethan has brought up the topic of my mother without even recognizing. I have terrible handwriting. I can't believe. I cannot believe I was going to ask you about handwriting. And yesterday, yeah. I have to tell you this. Yesterday, I sat and I bought a journal and I said, I'm going to reteach myself how to write in script. And when you were talking about the, I cannot believe you brought this up because yesterday I spent, I don't know, 20 minutes trying to remember how to write in script. Go ahead. The one, I letter, wanna... the one letter I could never get a handle on was the lowercase B in script. Cause that has that swoop up. Then it's supposed to, if you're not careful, it's, it's an F. <laughs> If you're too careful, it's an L. You can really screw up the lowercase b. So what I ended up doing is I just go up and then I go down and write basically uh, what, what what's a non-script B. I just, I have my own B. I can't, that B just confounded me. Dr. Hershenfeld, can you remember what you were about to say? Because this is, I cannot believe you're talking about calligraphy and and. and yesterday afternoon. I guess what it was, I, I'm that old that I can't remember. What I was about to say a minute and a half ago, as as That's insulting as the as it was coming back to me on how to write in script, I thought this is the most amazing technology. The script it flows across the page; it's so Very fast. Nice. And yeah. I thought, oh, this is anyway. I was fascinated by the hand mind coordination and how that can trigger thoughts. I can't. So go ahead. I'm curious about the handwriting, please. I was going to say I write like a third, third grader, maybe, maybe fourth grader. It's really pathetic. But my mother was taught with the Palmer method. You know, the Palmer method of teaching handwriting. I thought that was chiropractic. Chiropr chiropr no, it was all the rage in this country, I guess, you know, in, in the early part of the 20th century. And it was so beautiful. And everybody's handwriting was exactly the same. Yeah, both of my grandmothers had that beautiful yes. Palmer method. Yeah. And um, yeah, incidentally, invented by Arnold Palmer, the golfer. Mm. It was not just, yeah. The, well, he, Arnold Palmer was a golfer and not a mixologist? He, he, he moonlit as oh. a stenographer and a bar man. <laughs> Have you seen Donald Trump? I was looking at the check that he wrote to uh, Cone, right. and, and it looks like a lie detector test. It, it, it just goes up and down. I, well, someone in the, in the Times, someone in, in the op-ed this week called it a seismograph. Oh. Right. It was a very funny line. I can't remember who it was, but they referred to his signature as a seismograph. And, oh, and, it might have been Gail Collins because she was talking about he would write nasty things to her and, you know, you, you would send like hate mail. Yeah, his signature was just up and down. It, it, there, there, are no, there are no letters in his signatures, indecipherable. What is, so is, it couldn't be traced. That was probably it. I got very tired of how long my name is. Uh, <laughs> about 25 years ago, I started signing with my uh, initials mm. in script and uppercase. So, because it, it it would take all day to sign a check or to sign a. But if somebody asks you to initial something, then you, you write. Know, that's then you write that's your full the problem. Name. Now I just do the initials also. So, so uh, yeah. uh, and what about Willis Reed? You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I oh, I don't again, again mental telepathy, right? You, I was telling Leslie I was leaving my I was a kid and I was seeing a Freudian psych. <laughs> and I walked out. It was Dr. Ross. And I walk out the door. This is bizarre. And I saw Willis Reed. And I was, you know, in my 19. And I turned. I remember walking out of my doctor's office after a session and seeing mm -hmm. Willis Reed. Uh, and he was walking with a beautiful woman. And that was, you know, by then I stopped following sports. But I remember him. Was he, he limped off onto the floor. Onto the, with the, yeah, to, game to, seven against the Lakers. Right. Right. And uh, I was surprised he was that young. He was a young man. I can still remember, though, I can still, I think I, it, uh, uh, Dave DeBusher, Bill Bradley, uh, Willis Walt. Reed, Walt, Walt Frazier, Bar Barnett, uh, Earl Monroe, or did he come Monroe, later? Yeah. He Monroe. came later. Well, right. yeah. 
There was now, a- Ethan, here, here's, here's a conflict of memory. I remember clearly watching those Knicks with Ethan many, many years ago. He doesn't remember it. No, I remember going to the garden and seeing, uh, I wanted to see Frazier, but, but, Earl Monroe was on that night. so that But that would have been more like 75, 76, yeah. after Willis Reed. And this was before you had basketball on TV every night or every week. I, I don't think I don't think it was on TV, as far as I remember. Maybe just the okay. championship. One of my memories as a kid, I believe Earl Monroe played for Baltimore. Is that correct? And they, they brought him the Knicks. Like they, we, I couldn't believe as a kid that Earl Monroe was going to play for the Knicks. That was like the highlight of... <laughs> like the highlight of my year. I was so happy that the Knicks got Earl Monroe. I would love to get, how do you get back to that innocence and make it uh, genuine? But, Still but, aside. <laughs> but I think we're talking about all these inconsequential issues because the state of the world is just unbelievable. Is it? Or has it been ever thus? My father if he were here, would say ever thus. Ever thus. Because that he had had a stroke and that was the only thing he could say. That's not true. I'm just, uh, I mean, my dad, World War II. I mean, look at World War II. Yeah, that was bad. That was really bad. Are we, yeah. are we, I think we have more refugees mm-hmm. in the world than we had during World War II. But there are a lot of uh, conservatives who write uh, long articles for foreign affairs telling us we've never had it so good, that this is the world, this is the greatest time in the history of the world, which is not that I'm defending the conservatives, but aren't things, except for the fact that the planet has five more years left, aren't things pretty good? Well, what, I mean, well, that- what, Go ahead. That's not very good. Well, climate. The state, the state of our democracy, I don't think, is so good. The state of the nation, however, it's strong. It's strong, yes. Maybe it's stronger than we give it credit for. Okay. Maybe, I'm just being a contrarian, that maybe, uh, again, not we have a serious problem of Americans being evicted, and I'm not discounting the fact that more than half this country can't come up with a thousand dollars for an emergency, which is, uh, I think, if there's a problem with democracy, it's that. Uh, but the fact that we all hate one another may be our saving grace. That we'll never get to Nazi Germany or Italy because whatever uh, was what it, duck soup, whatever you're for, I'm against it. Right. Yeah. Maybe there's something good, Ethan. Is there any any value to no matter what one side does, the other side says? I will destroy you. I, I don't know. It, it, it really doesn't seem to me. We talk about the state of the nation these days as though there are two sides fighting for the destruction of each other. But that's really not what's going on. There's the fantasy on the side of the right wingers that they're living in existential threat from the left. And they use that as an excuse to, you know, to gerrymander and to right. suppress the vote and to... Right. Pass all sorts of archaic, moralistic laws as though they're defending something. They're not defending. They're on the attack. So we have one side attacking and telling you that they're defending themselves. Right. Me on the left, we're not attacking anybody. We're just trying to protect this rare bird of a country we have where there's actually a functioning democracy, Um, albeit a democracy that exports more weapons of war than any other country on earth. And we do all sorts of horrible things, but we have have certain good qualities and uh, they're under threat from from Texas and Florida and uh, all these maniacs and Fox News. And uh, so... But what if... It's not as bad as we think it is. I think you're right. It's not as bad. It's not. It's not existential. We're, we're, we've weathered all this crazy stuff for the last six I mean, years. So, some people and weather it. I, I don't want to be glib here. Some people don't weather. No, but the country. The country survives. Well, yeah. So did Germany. Germany is still a country. So is well, Cambodia. I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm not trying to be glib here. There's some real suffering here. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, I'm not those sure. countries didn't survive. As as they were, the name remains, but uh, the recipe was changed completely. And the, yeah. and you Germany, like the new Germany? I would assume you're you like the new Germany. The new Germany, you know, it's sort of like classic Coke and new Coke. Uh-huh. Like new Coke, it's exciting for a while, but classic Coke, you gotta say. No, right. the thing is, it's not old versus new Germany. It's really Germany. Then this brief eruption of cancerous Germany. And then Germany again. So it's not the fantasy that, you know, good Germany began in 1945. Uh, There was was a brief period of of fascism. Things Um, can go bad. And all it takes is a couple of people to ruin the party, right? Well, 
takes a lot of people, actually. It takes a lot of people, but it's, it is a great story that Germany was such a hellhole and exported hell around the planet. And then that was defeated. That is a great story. Yes, that, I mean, the fascism and that bug and that tendency, now we have it here to some degree. So you have to keep fighting it, but that is a, that is, a, it's miraculous. It's, we can still uh, take heart in that. Things haven't gotten that bad here or even close. But so. that tendency always exists yeah. among certain kinds of people. Did you guys listen to the Rachel Maddow podcast? I bet my sister keeps talking about it. It is so good about the the, the rise of, of many Nazi sympathizers in this country in the late 30s, early 40s, who were un, under the thumb of, of Nazi agents who were supplying them with money. This is congressmen that she's talking about. It's a very frightening right. episode in our history that, that Philip Roth Right. Wrote right. about in a fictional way. Well, let, let me change the subject, if you don't mind, because... I don't mind. We were talking on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour with a guest, and sometimes I get ideas in my head, and I can't shake them. And it's, why can't you see that this is the solution? So I, I, I hate to follow up. Uh, the, <laughs> I hate to use the word solution uh, after the previous conversation. But uh, I do believe this is the final solution for uh, raising our kids. The kids are going to college too. This is, I've got this bug up my, you, I think, how would your life have been different, Ethan, if the elite schools in America said we were no longer accepting anybody under the age of 24? What would your life have been like? The, 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 the varsity blues that went on, the pipeline from these elite prep schools into the elite colleges, to disrupt that pipeline, to rupture it and make kids who are going to be, you know, climate change notwithstanding, you've got kids who are going to live to be 150. Why should they be, why should they be set in stone at the age of 18 and, and be forced to find a college and a major? Shouldn't they be out living and maybe making some money to help pay for their college? What are your thoughts? I'm all for it. I think it's a great idea. I think we should have a national service in this country. And yes. After high school, they should they should do two for years. two years, though, not yeah. till 24. Yeah, I, I like that idea also. Two years. And at 20, you start college or at 21, maybe. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm saying 24 because this idea of having to, what well, having, well, that, oh, I'm not doing it right. Six years is a long time not to be in school. A lot well, can, yeah. You can't get back into school usually after six years. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't thinking. Uh, Somebody gave me an article from the Wall Street Journal. I'm sorry to mention that. But the title of the article was, Why Can't College Be More Like Prison? Mm -hmm. And I didn't really read it, I confess. I sort of skimmed it. But I think the idea was that this person was teaching college courses in prison. And the inmates were so avid for what they were learning and trying to improve and working hard. And that, you know, that's not what today's college is all about. Yeah, but I think there's not much to compete with. If you go into a prison to teach, yeah, I think sure. anything goes, anything they would, they would appreciate a, a hammer to the head. In, in America's prison system, can what what happens to the mind between say eighteen and twenty? Is it it's still growing, right? Yeah, but it's coming to its final neurological maturity, which happens you know in the early twenties. So getting kids into college, there, so there's a reason they you're shaping mind. The idea is we're shaping minds before yeah, that, and, and you're also protecting them by keeping them in 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 this semi-safe space for a few more years. The the frontal lobes where judgment takes place, they are not connected to the rest of the brain fully until the early 20s. And that's why, you know, 18, 19 is the best time to get a kid into the army and give him a gun. Right. And he'll go do whatever you want him to do. Now, Ethan, two weeks ago, talked about keeping your kid's head down more and that yeah. way the frontal lobe gets more blood what did you what were you but it's blood it's also yeah this was related to the problem that people are having these days with their cell phones because we're tilting our heads so much to right. look down at our screens we're causing some problems some v venous arterial and neurological pressures that are 
uh, adversely affecting both the development of the brain and also the development of the very critical cervical spine mm -hmm. and the scapular the scapular apparatus the scapulatus mm -hmm. and all of the uh, attending muscles the deltoids which also get overlooked the deltoids are so critical to development because they really determine whether a shirt and a jacket fit or not. <laughs> it's really the whole and you can't look like an adult unless the shirt and the jacket fit properly if it's hanging <laughs> off too far you yes. look like a little kid if it's too tight you look like you know you look like like an ape in a <laughs> human clothing so it's really critical what happens to the deltoids yeah i also wanted to say about the neurological development yes. is that this is something that also gets overlooked which is how much air has to enter uh it, it's not just blood flow it's air flow you want to get a lot of sort of wind it's like a breeze or a little zephyr you want to get going <laughs> through the ears moving things around <laughs> And that full that full level of, of ventilation does not kick in until the early 20s. So there's a lot of congestion. So it's 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 congestion. It's also in the in in the in the cortex. It's not just the frontal lobe, but the cortex needs a lot of ventilation, which is why it's important to have a, a, a fan on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> now, does this what about if you do this? Does that, that helps also? That that helps. Helps. But the problem yeah. is then then that that also uh, stimulates the sweat glands, mm -hmm. which counteracts uh, what you're trying to achieve with the ventilation, because that increases the humidity. And if you look at the combined gas law, uh, PV equals NRT, right. that pressure and volume are inversely correlated. And temperature is uh, directly correlated with those two. It, it can throw everything out of whack. And then you can actually get a steaming effect. <laughs> that could create steam, and then your hair loses all of its body. Right. You get a kind of like a, your hair will just fall down. Um, it's 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 not safe. You David, are, this is science. I, I, believe me, I'm ready to All buy the science. pill. Let's sell some pills. Write this it down. Is the, let's let's make. You know what we should make is some you know placebo and and sell them sugar pills and and you, Dr. Samuel Benjamin's sugar pills. Yeah. You should yeah. do like an infomercial, but it would be, I think it would be against the law. It but I could hear you late at night doing an infomercial, selling something. You know, it's quite dangerous. The instructions on a lot of shampoos will tell you and uh, conditioners will tell you to rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. You really should not do that. You should, you should repeat and then rinse. What do you mean? Otherwise, you're left with all sorts of stuff in your hair. Rinse and repeat. There's rinse and repeat. But really, you should put that second level of shampoo in and then rinse. So repeat and then rinse. I'm saying it's back. They have it backwards. Just see my line of cosmetics, uh, <laughs> doc, Dr. Benjamin's balms. What are you reading? Let's start with Dr. The Real Doctor. When did he I, become, I have I, a question, I, when he's doing that, at what age was he able to do that? What he just do? Who, what? Your son, when he was able to. to I just began that. That's just with you, David. I just. No, he's, 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 it's, a, it's a very long and developing. Family trait of bubamysis. <laughs> Blarney. Blarney. I should have known you. Growing up, yes. I would have been a very happy. I could see going over and uh, drinking black cherry soda and listening to Ethan. Uh, I would have been very happy listening to him go off on uh, the real doctors. Honestly, I was very serious. I was anxious. I was studying very hard. It was it was there was a lot of anxiety. I'm not kidding. But you were funny also. Okay, but I let it. I really let it. I, I took a. I took a big exhale when, when I got into college and all that pressure came off. I took a big exhale, and I still haven't completely inhaled since then. It's been uh, thirty years. So. What did you do today? What I'm curious. What did you do today? Oh, oh, today I swam in the morning, and then I led the core workout. We have this friend, this guy who's like our sort of coach and leader. He had a day off, so I had to lead the group, which was very fun. I got to play like gym teacher. And where was this? This is at the at the Metropolitan Pool. It's a gym. It's a municipal pool. By the way, speaking of civics and of whether this democracy functions, they have a water fountain in this city pool here. It's the Metropolitan Pool. It was built in 1922. It just turned 100 last year. There's a water fountain there. Fisher. What's fish. that? Hamilton Fish Pool. This is not the Hamilton Fish oh. Pool. That's that's on the Lower East Side, but that that's a nice one also. That's outdoors. This is an indoor Metropolitan Pool. Um, the, the water fountain broke in about 2014. 
And for about a year or two, they had a sign that said, uh, out of order will be repaired. Then that sign disappeared. Then they just painted it black. And that's how it's been for, for seven years. So I, I don't have a lot of faith in our ability as a country to deal with the, the basics. Um, right. But somehow we're letting, we're, we're, we're keeping the important things uh, alive to some degree. Like, like the, the pool, the pool is alive. That's true. The pool is important. It's so they more should use the more. Then they should use more chlorine if, right. if it's alive. I don't. I don't. What are you reading, Doctor Hirsch? I'm I'm mostly reading professional stuff right now because I've got a couple of courses going, and um, and when I get in bed at night to read, I fall asleep after about one page. So what can you do? Yeah. Um, I'm and I'm reading uh, those professional papers that he's supposed to be reading, and I just summarize <laughs> them for him. It's, it's like a it's like a cliff notes situation. No, 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 it's not. Um, what are you reading? Uh, I, well, okay, I, I read that. Oh, I told you about the novel I read. I'm going to tell you about something that a friend wrote that I absolutely love. I I read it today. And he's having a public reading of it for the first time next week. He's my friend Drew Valens. He's an actor. He's one of the founding members of Shakespeare in the Parking Lot, which is a local company that oh, does. I, I love yeah. that. Yeah. I, and, I've uh, never heard of that. Shakespeare in the Parking Lot? Yeah. So that's the thing here in New York. Uh, they do a whole season of Shakespeare outdoors in Bryant Park and uh, in various other places. Wow. Um, but he wrote a play called Lake Play, and I read it today, and there's a public reading of it next week. And if you get in touch with me, I can give you the information about it. Okay. But I thought it was just fantastic. So that was exciting to read a new work by a friend. That's just really great. Okay. Hey, uh, if you have time, tomorrow night at 730, we're doing a fundraiser for maybe a girl for office hours. She's the first drag queen ever to hold elective office in the United States. She sits on the Silver Lake City Council, and she's running for Adam Schiff's congressional seat, and Howie Klein is going to be there, and wow. you want to pop in and make some jokes. You're, you're, right. you're, you're welcome. And where are you performing next? Uh, I'm going to be in D.C. On, on Saturday night uh, at this fundraiser for this organization, and also get in touch with me if anyone's in the D.C. area. I have a, uh, a link. Um, the invitation comes with a, a donation form because it's a fundraiser. So to attend, it's a, right. some sort of donation. Good. But for the for the for the good of the animals. Good. Oh, if no one if anyone has not seen, see it on Netflix. Um, the Elephant Whisperers. The Elephant. And it won the Oscar. It won the Oscar for the short film this year. The Elephant Whisperers. And it was really good. And it beat out a friend of mine in the neighborhood. His short doc was also an Oscar nominee. That you should see also. It's called Stranger at the Gate, an incredible story about a guy who is casing a mosque. He was planning to blow it up. A guy comes out of the mosque, greets him, is very nice to him, invites him in. And this guy goes from being a, a murderous threat to then being a member, an important member of the community over not that long a stretch of well, time. Stranger at the Gate, an incredible story. We, yeah. we good. Very good. Thank you very all. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. We'll figure out a night, please. Okay, let's do it. Yes. Right, thank you. Okay. Toodaloo. Next week. Maybe a girl became America's first drag queen ever to win office after getting elected to the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council in 2019. Silver Lake is in Los Angeles and maybe is running for California's 30th congressional district a seat that will be vacated by Adam Schiff, who is running for Senator Dianne Feinstein's Senate seat, maybe spends her time fighting to end homelessness, and she is endorsed by Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny and the Blue America PAC, which means you must go right now to maybeagirlforcongress.org. I will spell that out for you. It's M-A-E-B-E-A-G-I-R-L for Congress. Dot org. Go to maybeagirlforcongress.org right now and give $5, $500. Give something so we can send maybe to Congress. You have to be an American citizen to donate. Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny is about to conduct this interview. But first, I'd like to ask three quick questions, if you don't mind, maybe. I don't mind at all. Do you take corporate money? Not a dollar, not a cent. Are you a millionaire? Not even close. <laughs> Do you believe in Medicare for all? 
I full heartedly believe in Medicare for all, uh, universal health care, or some sort of single payer health care system set up by the U.S. government. Do you believe there can be Medicare for all without first eliminating health insurance companies? Personally, I do think that uh, we shouldn't have um, health insurance companies on top of Medicare for all. I think that really leaves the door open for, um, you know, uh, sort of classism within healthcare. And so I think that we should all be guaranteed the best health care that is available. OK, before I turn this over to Howie, I'm going to ask you a question that pains me. I never I really never thought I'd have to ask this question, but you are a drag queen. And we're talking about Washington, D.C. and this new Congress. It'll be a new Congress when you get there. It pains me to ask you this question. Is it safe for a drag queen to serve in Congress? When you look at how Marjorie Taylor Greene treated Marie Newman, who has a child who Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, doesn't approve of, and the way Marjorie Taylor Greene treated uh, Congresswoman Marie Newman, who, thanks to Howie Klein, has been on the show. When you look at how Marjorie Taylor Greene treated Marie Newman for having a child who Marjorie Taylor Greene didn't approve of, do you think it, it, it pains me to ask you this question? Is it safe for you? You know, I think, um, I think the almost more important question is it's safe not to have a drag queen and not to have a trans person in Congress. You know, we're looking at uh, historic levels of anti-LGBTQIA legislation moving through state legislatures across the U.S. We're finally starting to see, and I knew this was coming, uh, anti-LGBTQIA legislation moving into the federal chambers. And so while I definitely am always concerned about my safety, I'm more so concerned about the safety of LGBTQIA people all across the nation. We, it's not an exaggeration to say that we are under attack right now from many different fronts and many different angles, um, you know, from the drag angle, absolutely. But, you know, I think, um, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more, but, you know, these anti-drag bills Essentially, what they are is they are anti-trans bills. And there are, you know, to it's, it's hard to define a, a drag performer. Anybody can do drag. It tends to often be, um, you know, queer people that are, are drag performers, but there's drag kings, there's drag queens, there are non-binary performers, there are cisgender drag performers, there are transgender drag performers. Uh, I'm a trans person and I'm also a drag queen. And um, so, you know, when you have these bills like the one that just passed in Tennessee saying that, uh, you know, it's you can't you can't have drag performances. What does that say about trans people even just existing? Um, because they're basing a lot of this off of assigned gender at birth, uh, which they usually define based off of what genitals they see when the child comes out. And it also neglects uh, the existence of intersex people. You know, there are so many more intersex people than most people would realize, uh, primarily because most of the time we're not looking in people's pants that we don't know. Right. So, um, you know, these bills are extremely dangerous and uh, I'm digressing a little bit, but to go back to your question, do I feel like it's safe to be in Congress? Uh, yeah, I absolutely am always concerned about my safety. I mean, even at the drag shows that I perform at currently, you know, drag has been a great tool for me to be able to advertise my campaign and to bring to light a lot of issues that are facing the LGBTQIA community. But I think um, I think I've got a lot of people looking out for me, and I think it's more important to consider what will happen if we don't have more queer representation, if we don't have transgender representation in our highest highest levels of government. Right, Howie, so think- the founder and treasurer of the Blue America Pack, whatever he says, we do, and he says to <laughs> donate to you. And so it's maybe for Congress.org. Did I get it? Uh, it's maybe a girl for Congress.org. Right. Maybe a girl. My direct uh, act blue link is actblue.com 
slash donate slash maybe a girl m a e b e a g i r l howie take it away please yeah it's funny maybe uh, a lot of what you said is uh answers many of the questions i wanted to ask you but something that david brought up that i didn't think about about the the idea of um of, of safety uh you know made, made me think that um about something that just happened recently. Blue America was uh, sponsored a, um, a fundraiser for, for Cori Bush, but, but not for Cori Bush to, uh, to raise right. money for her campaign. It was strictly for Cori Bush to raise uh, uh, money for protection. And she told me and she told me the, the people who came that she gets not just threats to herself, which she gets all the time, but threats to her family as well, including people calling up and saying, we, we know we, where your child goes to school and things like that. And I don't remember the exact figure, but she, I think it was something like a quarter of a million dollars a year for security that she has to provide. Congress doesn't provide it for her. They give security for the speaker uh, and for some officers of Congress, but not for the individual members. And, you know, my thought is you know why are they why are they attacking Corey like that and making a life for her so dangerous? And it has to do with what she stands for. You know the fact that she's a woman is a problem. The fact that she's African American is a problem. And for you it would be similar, maybe even to the you know ten times more di- difficult because you would be the first transgender person in Congress. I I don't want to say the first drag queen in Congress because George Santos, <laughs> uh, he, although he's not a drag queen anymore. He was a drag performer at one time. Uh, and, and all these Republicans know that. And I, I think on some level they, they accept it. But th- what I was getting at was just to, just to, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to make you paranoid or anything, but ha- have you thought at all about what it's going to be like, uh, you know, being the, the first transgender person in Congress and dealing with it the way Corey has to deal with it, you know, because th- you know, another way that people are going to think about this is that Corey's issues that she brings up, these right wing Republicans, extremely um, uncomfortable. And, you know, I know that you're not exactly the same as Corey Bush, but if I had to think of someone in Congress who you were really, really, really similar to, it would be Corey Bush in terms of policy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I. Uh I've definitely thought about this, Howie. And, you know, I, it's funny because I, I'm always thinking a, a few steps ahead. And of course, I'm thinking about what will happen and what it will be like to actually walk through the, the halls of Congress as a, a trans person, as a, a drag performer. I mean, obviously, I'm not going into Congress, you know, as a drag queen with a three foot tall wig. Um, but, I think uh, I'm, I'm thinking about it currently. You know, I think about, you know, this is my third time running for Congress. I ran in 2020. My campaign started to gain traction in 2020. Uh, we missed advancing to the general election by less than 1% in 2020. So I had to run again in 2022. 2022, I made it past the primary. I ended up beating out seven candidates. And... Um, and so this time, I think it's actually, this is the time it's going to happen. I am feeling really confident that I'm going to win this time because I came in second place out of nine candidates. The incumbent has announced that he's not seeking re-election. I have a really strong base here in Los Angeles, and this is based off of my community work uh, on the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council as a drag performer, as a community advocate. Uh, so this is something I'm actually concerned about right now. You know, I think about the fact that, you know, I perform in a weekly drag brunch and it makes me concerned not only for my own safety, but for the safety of my fellow performers, of our audience members who come and support these wonderful, beautiful drag shows. Um, And so, you know, we think about things like, you know, what happened at Club Q and years ago, what happened at Pulse? And does it scare me? Yes. But at the same time, we cannot be scared back into the closet. We cannot be scared out of existence. And I think that that's very important to to have very openly out, unapologetic queer people, first of all, just living, 
existing and thriving, but also being representatives for a huge um, segment of our population. You know, even when you look at just uh, gay and lesbian representation in Congress, um, we are severely underrepresented when you look at how many queer people live in the United States. Uh, it And the numbers in Congress don't match the numbers of actual queer people. And the fact that there has never been a transgender represented representative federally elected to our Congress, you know, that bothers me. And a big reason that that bothers me is because it's like a, a good friend of mine says, uh, who's also transgender, if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. And transgender people and queer people at large are literally on the menu right now. And what disgusts me is the fact that there are no queer people at the table creating this legislation or even saying why this kind of legislation is harmful. You know, the conservative right, the GOP, is using a lot of um, mythical tropes to uh, spread their message of hate. And, you know, what started off as, you know, this is about the children, this is about protecting kids. Um, you know, they started saying these kinds of things when they started introducing, um, you know, anti-sports, anti-trans sports bills and anti-trans bathroom bills and anti-trans locker room bills. Um, but, there are no credible statistics about queer and trans people, specifically trans people, um, you know, using their trans status to go in and abuse people. Um, you know, a big fear is that um, cisgender men will uh, pretend to be trans to go in and assault people in bathrooms and locker rooms. And let me tell you, that is not a transgender problem. That is a cisgender male problem. And so it is not fair that our rights should be denied because of the potential abuse of cisgender men. And that just speaks to the greater patriarchy and the issues with patriarchy. And um, it, it just really baffles me that that one would think that my rights should be hindered because of what a cisgender male would potentially do. And I think it's also pretty obvious, you know, you, we keep hearing about these stories of, um, you know, child molestation and actual pedophiles and actual groomers. And uh, when it, how often is it actually drag queens or transgender people? It's very, very rare. Um, much more rare than, you know, the cisgender male population. Um, I feel like I've seen so many stories recently where it's the youth pastor so does that mean that we ban churches to protect children? I mean, what is? I, the, do you mind? I'm if I, not. Do you mind if I, yeah, please. The the I used to take my kids to uh, the West Hollywood Halloween parade. Mm -hmm. Is the feeling on the right that if your kid attends drag queen story hour, it's going to plant an idea in their head and they're suddenly going to start? changing is that, that's what they're afraid of right i mean i feel like theoretically that's what they're saying they're afraid of but the fact of the matter is you know you look at somebody like me i um uh, i come from a mixed jewish and catholic background i went to catholic grade school i went to catholic high school and um you know i was absolutely groomed by the church <laughs> to try to be a uh, cisgender heterosexual and i am neither <laughs> and so um, you know, they tried their hardest to implant these ideas in me and actually were trying to implant these ideas in me. And it didn't change who I fundamentally am. Uh, you know, you know, there is an innateness to being transgender. There's an innateness to being uh, homosexual. And, you know, the church and my schooling tried their absolute damn hardest to try to not make me that way. And there was nothing that they could do. So in my opinion... So there her. isn't. There's no way. So we understand this. Mm -hmm. You can bring your child to Drag Queen Story Hour, and all it's going to do is prevent a suicide. It's going to. In other words, if a child is innately not uh, a, a drag, uh, going to dress in drag, it's nothing's going to happen. But it's going to open up a door for a child who realizes, well, I'm a little different and there's another path for me. Maybe I won't have to commit suicide. 
Correct. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely the fact. I mean, here's the thing. Drag Queen Story Hour is not going to be turning anybody gay or trans. It just it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, there might be some sort of uh, nurture in the nature versus nurture arguments when it comes to queerness. But in my opinion, and again, it's 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 set in stone when you're pretty young. And, you know, I've had an, I, I've, I've known without being able to put into words since I was about five years old that I was queer. I was, it wasn't until later on that I was able to, in retrospect, um, define my experience and my thoughts with the vocabulary and the language. Um, and it wasn't actually until I was in my mid to late twenties that I realized that I was a transgender person, but I will tell you, none of that was affected by what I saw or didn't see on TV or any sort of entertainment that I was exposed to. And uh, so, yeah, drag queen story hour is not going to be turning kids gay or transgender. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to tell young kids who also may not have the vocabulary or the understanding of what queer is, but, are starting to realize they're a little bit different, that it's okay to be different. So this is about saving lives. Yeah, absolutely. This absolutely is about saving lives. And I think about my experience, you know, I, I graduated high school in 2004, um, almost 20 years ago. And I, I really wish that when I was a, a queer youth, when I was a teenager, that that I had people telling me that it's okay to be queer, that it's okay to be trans uh, because we weren't even really even seeing it in the media at that point. You know, the only media at that time that was very outwardly queer was, um, you know, shows like Queer as Folk, um, which I think was on Showtime or HBO and Will and Grace. But there weren't a whole, there wasn't a lot of queer representation. And so I thought that there was something wrong with me. And I really feel for queer youth today because not only are, are there people saying there's something wrong with queer, they're actually trying to legislate against our existence. And that's not to say that there hasn't been anti-queer legislation, you know, for decades and decades and decades. You know, there was, you know, don't ask, don't tell, uh, DOMA, all of that was happening. But the levels of anti-queer legislation that we're seeing today are unprecedented in modern history. This year alone, there's already more than 450 anti-LGBTQIA bills moving across various state legislatures and the federal legislature. And I can't imagine what it's like to be a queer youth today in seeing that there are people out there trying to legislate against my existence. Howie, what is the connection between this and fascism? You kind of touched on it at the top. Between, between, well, I mean, fascism is, is an authoritarian system that's tr- that is trying to, uh, you know, make everybody into into something that fits in a box. And, you know, certainly uh, LGBTQ people don't fit into uh, the fascist uh, ideal. But can we just move away from this for a second? Uh, because Blue America didn't endorse you maybe because um, because of any kind of identity politics. The reason we endorsed you is because we looked at you and we looked at the other candidates and we thought you would be the best person to go to Congress based primarily on your your policy positions and and the work that you've been doing uh, as a uh, as a Silver Lake official. As I got to think about it more and more, I thought, yes, there is no, uh, there, there are no transgender people in, in Congress. This is something that's coming up a lot now, and it would be really, really advantageous to have somebody um, who is a transgender person in Congress to at least be able to talk about the issue from a, from a lived experience. But still, the reason that Blue America endorsed you was because of your policy positions. We haven't really talked about that at all. Uh, and I wanted to ask you how your positions differ from those of your um, uh, of the other contenders, some of the other people who are running uh, in, in this district. I should mention I live in the same district that uh, that maybe does. I appreciate that question. And I appreciate that commentary, Howie. Um, I will say that I'm always happy to discuss um, queer LGBTQIA issues uh, at any point. But 
I will have to agree with you that a lot of people have uh, mischaracterized my campaign as being specifically and only pro LGBTQIA. Uh, that's a huge part part of my platform, but it's very much intersectional with the rest of my platform. Um, when when I think about um, universal health care, and when I think about housing for all, and when I think about education for all, you know, those are issues for everybody, but those are also intersectionally queer issues. You know, those are matters of racial justice as well. You know, you, healthcare for all is racial justice. Healthcare for all is queer justice. Housing for all is racial justice. Housing for all is queer justice. Um, environmental justice is queer justice. Environmental justice is racial justice. And so, I've always thought of my platform as being an intersectional humanitarian platform. And I've always thought to myself that if everybody had guaranteed healthcare, housing, and education, this would be a better world for everybody and would create so much opportunity for prosperity, uh, not only for everybody, but also for the state itself. You know, I think a lot of people are concerned about well, if we start giving out things for free, nobody is going to want to work. And simply, that's right. not true. I think there is something innate about human beings wanting to be productive and wanting to do things. Will there be some people that try to scam the system? Yes, there always have been, there always will be. But that's not a justifiable reason for denying healthcare, housing, and education to everybody. So those are kind of the main tenets of my platform. Uh, but again, it's all intersectional. Uh, my my big t my big issues are again universal health care, housing for all, education for all, environmental justice, racial justice, LGBTQIA rights, reproductive rights, and staying out of war. And again, those are all very intersectional issues. You they don't necessarily stand alone on on their own. So you can't have racial justice without having health care justice, without having housing justice justice without having educational justice and environmental justice. So let me, let me interrupt for a second. This, this is a very, very, very blue district. The no Republican is going to get anywhere. They, they didn't even, they don't even get past the primary. So they won't be running. It'll just be two Democrats running against each other. One, presumably you. Now, our, how is it, are, are there some Democrats who are not running on the um, platform that you are running on? Yeah, I would say most of them are. Well, you know, I don't want to, I, I definitely don't want to run a smear cam, cam, campaign against anybody who's running. There are some other decent people that are running, but the decent people that are running are either two establishments, in my opinion, or they accept corporate money, or they accept charter school money, or they are, um, you know, maybe don't have any sort of experience uh, in community level politics. Uh, for me, you know, I'm the only candidate who hasn't has an accepted corporate uh, influence money, hasn't accepted charter school money. And that has been a facet of my campaigning since day one. And what I'll also say about that is the fact that, you know, it's very interesting to me and it seems very opportunistic that every single Democrat who is running in this race, it's their first time running. And if they really had a concern for this district, why now when it's suddenly opportunistic because the incumbent has announced that he is not seeking re-election? Right. You've, oh, been exactly. run, you, you've been running against Adam Schiff. How many times did you run against Adam Schiff? I ran against him twice in 2020 and 2022, and this is my third time running in 2024. And she's done better each of the times that she's run and is now looked, looked at as, um, what, as, as if not the front runner, one of the front runners. Uh, you know, people feel pretty strongly that maybe is going to get in, uh, past the primary and into the general election among the nine uh, people who are running. Some of whom seem, I mean, I, I'm, when I read about some of them, I'm thinking, are they even Democrats? Or are they just, you know, because they don't sound anything like you when it comes to the policies that, they, uh, that they're that they backing? Have yeah, they, absolutely. Uh, Many of them are Democrat in name only. I'm sorry? Say that once again, How, Howie. I think delay, and I, I was asking if, if uh, there are any um, 
uh, debates that you've done or, or forums or if there's anything planned like that? You know, there have been no debates or forums as of yet. Uh, we're still very early on. The primary election is um, almost a year away from now. It's March 5th, 2024. So I imagine we'll be starting to do forums and debates a little bit later on in the process. Uh, in fact, when I ran in 2022, the only debate that was organized independently was the debate organized for the general election hosted by the League of, uh, League of Women's Voters uh, out of Glendale. And that's when I directly uh, debated Adam Schiff. And I don't think he was prepared for it because uh, I don't know how to de- delicately say this, but I mopped the floor with him. And I think he was expecting that, you know, because I am not a congressperson and because he had held his position for 22 years that it was, you know, very secure. But I I had the right answers. And, you know, the right answers are basically we need to get corporate influence out of politics. And I know that a lot of people love Adam Schiff. Um, You know, a lot of people are excited that he's running for Senate. But uh, the fact of the matter is he does really take a lot of corporate influence money. And a lot of it is very ugly corporate influence money. Um, You know, it's weapons manufacturers and defense contractors. And then folks should not be surprised when he turns around and he votes in the interests of those corporate interests rather than in the interests of the people that elected him. Um, So I'm excited. I didn't know that he wouldn't be running again this year. I was planning on running again, just because of the fact that we did so well in 2022. You know, I ended up receiving over 60,000 votes. And what's really incredible about how well we did in 2022 is how much I was outspent by. I was outspent more than 500 to one. And I still ended up receiving over 60,000 votes. I spent less than 50 cents per vote. Um, which is really unheard of in politics. And it gives me hope because it shows that people aren't voting on people based off of how much money they raise. They're voting for people based off of their policy positions and their platform. We we have limited time here. So how are uh, going to endorse? <laughs> I doubt that Schiff is going to endorse me. I doubt it. I, I think he might even stay out of it altogether. But I think that's very interesting. I mean, if I was in office for 20, for 22 years, I would at least want to have a say in who I think the next person should be. But I think he's trying to stay out of the race from what I've heard. Howie, we're we're almost out of time. I'd like to ask a question and then I'll give you the last question, if that's okay with you. Sure. You're uh, an advocate for the homeless. Could Mm -hmm. you speak specifically to the problem for the LGBTQ community when it comes to homelessness? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, as with a number of other issues, um, homelessness disproportionately impacts LGBTQIA people. Uh, In fact, 40% of unhoused youth nationwide identify as LGBTQIA. And uh, the sad part of that is... Why why do they end up homeless? A a big part of that is um, rejection from family which I think is absolutely disgusting to throw out your, throw your child on the street because they are queer or because they're trans. Um, another big and, reason and is. Al, you're going to come to San Francisco or Los Angeles if you live in Tennessee or Kentucky or Sarah Huckabee's Arkansas, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a problem another re- dumped on Los Angeles, in other words. Another big reason is uh, employability. You know, um, the reason we have to have these laws saying that it is illegal to not hire or to fire somebody because they're queer or trans is because of the fact that that happens. Uh, My cousin, who's a lesbian, she lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She was fired for being gay in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So this isn't just happening in, you know, remote parts of Arkansas or Mississippi or Alabama it's happening in a lot of places. And it so it's cool. extremely of, critical that we have protections for LGBT people. A lot of people don't believe this, but it is still legal in America to fire someone because they're gay. Yeah, in more than half of the states. Howie, last question, please. Uh, actually, we're, we're out of time, I'm noticing, in overtime. So 
may, maybe uh, unlike many uh, candidates, when you ask her a question, she goes uh, goes for it and tries to uh, be really thorough, and she was. And uh, so no more questions uh, for this week. But let's have maybe back again. I would. Would you come back? Maybe. I, I would love to come back. This has been a great convo. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Howie Klein from Down with Tyranny. Read Howie every day over at Down with Tyranny and donate to the Blue America Pack. And Howie Klein and, of course, me are instructing you to go to maybeagirlforcongress.org right now. If you're an American citizen, you have to donate. We don't ask for much on this show. We ask for very little. So I'm asking you to go to maybeagirlforcongress.org right now. Five dollars, fifty dollars, five hundred dollars. It's M A E be a girl for Congress dot org. Howie, before you go, why is it important to donate to candidates like maybe even if there's a possibility she's gonna lose? Why is it still important to support Well, there's also a possibility that she's going to win. Right. And it's important to support good candidates like maybe who stand for the things that we are desperately in favor of and that uh, the corporate candidates don't uh, don't support. And this corporations and uh, the establishment shower their candidates with money. and And it's difficult for our candidates to be able to get their messages out. And it's especially important to donate early. Uh, maybe said earlier that, um, that her primary isn't until uh, till March of next year. So people might think, oh, well, well uh, maybe I'll give her some money then. No, she needs the money now. Now is the most important time. It, the, as time goes on, the money become the money is always important. But it, it, the most important money is the early money when uh, our candidates are organizing their campaigns and establishing the fact that they are uh, they are credible candidates. And for a candidate like maybe who doesn't take any money from corporations, no matter what, uh, individual donations are really, really, really important for her to be able to get up and running. And let me just say something about my listeners' mental health. A lot of you feel paralyzed and powerless. I promise you, if you forego a non-union cup over at Starbucks and instead give that $5. If you go to maybeagirlforcongress.org, you'll feel better. You will feel empowered by giving $5, $50, $500 by going to maybeagirlforcongress, M-A-E-B-E, agirlforcongress.org. It's for your own mental health. When you read what's going on in this country, these fascists, and you want to take them on, this is how you take them on. And you will feel better. I promise you, $1, $5 for your own mental health. Go to maybeagirlforcongress.org and support maybe. Thank you, Howie Klein, for introducing us to maybe. And maybe, please come back. Maybe we'll do a fundraiser for you uh, with office hours that I conduct, if, if uh, we can talk about that. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to come back. Thank you.